Oh, it's nothing. Panties. Turns out my wife wears the same brand as Miss Gorin. Welcome to episode 55 of the Columbo podcast, where we're both trying to work out whether our respective partners wear the same brand of underwear as anyone famous. It seems unlikely. You think? Victoria's Secret, is she not a person? Oh, Victoria, I was going to say Tesco. All right, George. <laughs> George Asda. David Beckham. Does, she, does he do female underwear? I have genuinely no idea. Okay. Probably does. How are we? All the better for not having to watch that episode anymore. Oh, it was a stinker. Oh dear. Do you agree? I didn't enjoy much of it. No. Some of the performances were okay. Um, apart from that, it was... Well, you you sort of, you sort WhatsApped me, didn't you, as we were recording? I did, during, during the middle of the episode. What did you say? So this is Commodore-esque. What was my reply? <laughs> I don't think I can say it on the radio. Bleeping bleep. Yeah, I really struggled with this one. Not an episode that that I have watched many times. I must admit, I've probably not seen it that much more than than you have now with one viewing. Well, I'm not surprised, to be honest. I mean, even Columbo seemed to, Peter Fox seemed to mail it in this week. Yeah. Nothing made sense, it was lazy, it was the first half hour. Didn't go anywhere. I mean, it's the last episode of the season, so you wonder if they just wanted to get off on their holidays. Yeah, it looks like they were on their holidays already. It made me, as I was watching this, I I was dreaming, I was longing for a sort of three or four hander like, it really just shows you how strong something like uh, Murder by the Book is, was. Yeah, yeah. Where there are two or three characters, they set it up, you, you had the, the motive, you had the killing, all within the first few, few moments, or the first few scenes. Yeah. It was obvious what was going on and why it was going on. Yeah, I mean, and it, we're, we're going to come to some of these things. So we, we don't want to go into too okay, much. Okay, we don't. Right but, now, but, but this is actually yeah. This this annoyed me watching this. I would say frustrated as much as annoyed. Mm-hmm. It's difficult to follow this episode. It is difficult to follow, and nothing makes any sense really. There's no, like I said before, there. It's just you know, a classic episode. You get a really strong motive. You understand why, the, even though you don't agree with it necessarily. It's clear. It's precise. You know why they're doing it, and you can understand the position why they might be so uh, so inclined. Yeah. With this, it was a mess the whole way through. A mess. Certainly was. Hmm. Well, we got on with it. Let's just get this this episode over and done with. Yeah, well, we've got the season review to come, so that's something for folk to stick around for. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Why don't you give us this week's summary, Ian? In Murder in Malibu, we meet Wayne Jennings, a playboy involved in a secret relationship with novelist Teresa Gordon. His proposals of marriage have met with procrastination, so when Gordon announces on television that she intends to marry him, he is delighted. That night, he receives a call indicating that Teresa has changed her mind and drives to her Malibu home to kill her. Columbo is tasked with solving the homicide, but his first line of inquiry falls flat when the coroner seemingly exonerates Jennings. With his top suspect in the clear, can the lieutenant find a clever solution, or will it just be pants? Thank you for that, Ian. You see, the thing is about this episode is that the characters were not shaped and created with enough personality or or drive or motive. The killer, as you mentioned there, was a playboy. I could not work out. I never, I've never, never managed to work out. Was he, was he a gigolo? Did he have independent wealth and means? Was he a rich man? I don't think so. But you see, he's playing the. We're, we're jumping. Ahead. I'm jumping ahead of ourselves here. But it annoyed me that it would have been fine if it was a standard character of a, a, of a younger, good-looking man using these older women with 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 wealth, and he is skint and living off them. But. It was never clear because he's, he, he drives this sort of fast car. Now, that, the, the car might be a gift, but at one point he appeared to be living in a, a massive house. He plays in celebrity tennis matches. Does does he have money or doesn't he have money? I don't uh, understand what yeah, who is or he what known he is. or not known because he says in one hand he's playing in a celebrity tennis match, which mm-hmm. suggests the folk might know who he was. Mm. But on the other, he was spotted with her and nobody had a clue who he was. Yep. So is he known or not known? And if he's not known, which I suspect he isn't, 
Why is he in a celebrity tennis tournament? Yes. I, know, I know he was lying about that, but still, it wouldn't be believable yeah, if it wasn't like something that could happen. Yeah, you, don't have a, you don't cheat on your wife by saying you're going to play in a celebrity match because you're a, a famous person. Yeah, it's, to be fair, that's what I've told uh, my girlfriend tonight. Uh, yeah. I'm well, in a celebrity yeah. tennis tournament. Mm, she doesn't understand our worldwide fame in the podcast. <laughs> that's the thing. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so these characters were not defined well enough. He should have been quite obviously... Shown to have no cash, no money, no means. If that's the story. If that's the story. But he did also show up with a boot full of flowers, which must have been purchased. Yeah. But does he get an allowance from Teresa, or from Teresa and other people, or who knows? We don't know. We don't find out. We don't know anything about this guy. No. While we're talking about the, the, the sort of negative elements of this this episode, it's disappointing to find that the writer is Jackson Gillis. None other than Jackson Gillis. Well, to be fair, he left a bit of a sour taste in the mouth after his last effort. He did. The episode that shall not be named. Yes. Yeah, something with Voldemort. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he's been a he's written some amazing episodes over the over the years. Early doors, he did certainly seasons one and two. He was quite Probably, heavily yeah. involved. He was one of the main men for mm. the stories, and he got a hat tip in Candidate for Crime. Remember. Mm-hmm. I do remember that. So I'm disappointed that he's been involved in this nonsense. It was his ninth of 11 Colombo episodes. I mean, he's coming back. He is. I hope they don't continue on this path. From Commodore to this. I don't I don't get it. Both of these episodes have deliberately tried to deceive the viewer, which is not what Colombo has been about other than that. Mm-hmm. Outside of those two episodes, it doesn't do that. I know. Annoying. Yeah. Let's start. <laughs> Did we not already do that? Well, let's start prop. Let's talk through. Let's get the chronology going. Yeah. Okay. We're in Beverly Hills. I, thought, I think it might be Rodeo Drive. Not sure. Bookshop anyway. Yeah. There's a long line of delighted women outside this queuing up uh, to have their book signed by Teresa Gordon. And we see a woman who we come to learn is Helen driving a man. The passenger is Wayne Jennings, the chap we've been referring to. Yeah. Helen is unimpressed by Gordon, apparently, but wants to see what she looks like as she is a big deal. Yeah, she's maybe the the E.L. James of her day. Mm -hmm. Helen is quite obviously jealous, but disappointedly has to admit that Gordon is quite pretty. Well, she thinks she's maybe been photoshopped in her images or whatever the 1990 (laughs) equivalent of that was. But no, she she accepts she is a, a good looking okay. woman. Before she removes a ring and returns it to Jennings. I didn't get that. I don't is this an engagement ring? Is it just a piece of jewellery? Were they role playing? Who knows? The impression I got she is doing his books, but mm-hmm. she's doing more than just his books. She's doing him or he's doing her. They're doing each other. There's some kind of doing going on. Yeah. And I don't think she's under any illusions as to the nature of their relationship. Not at all. Um, I've noted here that she seems to understand the the situation. Uh, she has an internal conflict. She knows she's smart enough to know that she shouldn't be feeling this way. Yeah. And being she knows she's being conned effectively. Yeah, and I think she says later on maybe to Colombo that she just takes what she can get. She knows that mm-hmm. she didn't have a chance for a relationship with this guy, but you know if something else was an offer, she was prepared to take that. We then see Jennings change his jacket from his sports car, which he's parked in the alley beside the bookshop, which he enters to the surprise and delight of Teresa Gordon. And they leave in his car for her place, and he tells her stories and tales about being with a tax his tax guy. Yeah. I mean, one other thing that we noted, which doesn't turn out to mean anything, but he owes money to her. Mm-hmm. Not to Teresa, to Helen. The tax woman. Yes. I think that's him trying to establish that he doesn't have money, but then why? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. In the car on the way to her home, she tells him he doesn't have to explain where he's been. That she doesn't try, she isn't trying to sort of chain him down, but wants to know where he was on Monday night when she tried calling. And he tells her he was reading for a part in a movie. It wasn't very convincing. No. She wants to go away on Sunday, but he says he's going to stay and play in a this celebrity tennis match that we've mentioned at Palm Springs. She is upset about this, but 
he woos her with some nonsense about the flowers that he, be- he planted in the petunias and all that sort of stuff. And it's, I mean, to be fair to him, possibly for the only time in this episode, she's just been away doing what she wants for six weeks, and now she's mm-hmm. back expecting him to drop everything and come running to her. Yeah, sure, but I mean, it's if it's her job, it's not like she's been away enjoying herself with her friends. If it was a less glamorous, I mean, if he, if if it was a, she was a long distance lorry driver. Okay, you wouldn't, you know, that's if it's a, a mundane job and you return home and you say, listen, I'm back, I'm exhausted, I've been working, yeah, let's spend some time together. Uh, that would be more, I think that the partner would be more inclined to, to spend some time with him. But we do learn that he's bitter about the fact that she won't let him accompany her publicly. Yeah. That's to follow. The next scene is the jacuzzi. Well, that's, <laughs> that's where it follows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she wants to know what he has not told her yet. And why he is desperate to run off. This is one of those loaded questions that you sometimes get. What are you not telling me? Mm-hmm. And you're thinking, I don't know. Well, what am I not telling you? <laughs> you start to worry and go, am I not saying something? Yes, or something. Oh, what's the correct answer here? Does to she know? know? Mm. <laughs> she suggests that perhaps Jennings has met someone else, but he denies this. And did you notice he quite violently pulls the back of her hair? It was quite aggressive. Mm-hmm. But he then quickly proposes marriage. and But she is fairly reticent with regards to this due to what others may think. Yeah, she's obviously got a bit of guidance from her agent on this, I suspect. We'll come to learn mm-hmm. who that is later. But she says she's been away for six weeks and he makes the point it's been six years. So obviously it's a long-term relationship mm-hmm. between them and she has spent the whole six years preventing him from letting anyone know they're together. Yeah, in fairness, that... That's not great, is it? No. Six a years long time. and you're hiding. And this is the other thing as well. But how old was he six years ago? Well, but that's that's the point I was going to make. I mean, I'm looking at the guy and I'm guessing I've not looked up what the you know the actor's real age was at the time. But he could certainly for me pass mid thirties. Yeah. Right? If I'd actually had to guess his age, what how old he I looked. I'd say late thirties. I'd have said, yeah, he's thirty eight. Okay. Now she could easily pass for what? Forty eight. Perhaps, yeah. It's, a ten it years. Look that it's bad. not yeah, this isn't it's not a scandalous age difference. He's a little bit younger, but not No, I don't think there is. I don't think she's worried about the age difference. I think her agent is in her ear saying if people know you're with him, it's gonna damage your sales, folk won't come and see you. Mm. I suspect. We don't, we never learn that for sure, but from the, the relationship that we do learn about I I suspect that's what happens. Yeah. In any case, she thinks about the proposal the kiss, he claims not to care about what other people think, and she tells him she will try and decide quickly this time, I think she says. Teresa Gordon was played by Janet Margolin. She died in 1993, aged just 50. That's a shame. Yes. This would have been one of her final roles. In fact, Ghostbusters 2 was her final screen appearance. Okay. She was also in Annie Hall, Mod Squad, Starsky and Hutch, and Murder, She Wrote. She was Tony nominated in 1962. It's later that day or the next morning. Yeah, uh, a woman phones and I wasn't even clear which woman it was. No, that's the thing about this episode as well. There's so many different people. Please give us a core cast of three or four people and three or four different scenes. Is this the woman he phones later? I don't know. It's not clear. When he picks up the phone later when he's in bed, is that what you're referring to? No, not the late night call. When he phones out... Um, he answers the phone to Mrs Rocker right. and Jennings tells her that she should not have called but she is excited by the promise that her husband could potentially get the rights to one of Gordon's books. So Jennings has obviously been trying to further his career by making promises that I believe Gordon is not aware of. Obviously not. It does also sound like Wayne's on his way to meet this woman. Yeah. Gordon herself comes through to the room and Jennings says that it was simply a wrong number before leaving. Yeah, I suspect she chooses not to question that. Yeah. Don't ask, don't tell. The next scene is quite horrible. It's horrifically written. It's it's so clearly written by a man mm. as well. So Gordon is at a TV studio. She's being interviewed on stage and there's a live studio audience. What happens? It's almost too cringeworthy to mention. One of the, it's an audience of almost, I think, entirely women. One of them asks why she never married. 
And another woman in the audience shouts, good question. Yeah, it's horrible. It's none of their business. And they come across as really desperate, psychotic bunny boilers, don't they? It's really weird. She deflects, as you would do. Mm-hmm. And then, no, no, before the, <laughs> before that, before she does deflect, some woman then starts to quote, quote her book. Well, no, that's a wee bit later. Uh, the next question, another question gets asked now about the men in her book. How were they inspired? Oh, yeah. Who, who are they based on? Yes. And she says, oh, they're different people. She's read Ivanhoe 50 times. That's it. But one woman pipes up. Uh, she said that she saw, when she was in the bookshop the previous day. Yep. Saw Jennings and then quotes the book about how his beautiful long eyelashes and blue eyes and insists that this is the man. It must be. It's disgusting. And then flowers are delivered to the set <sighs> for her. What a talent. Well, who would bring that out on stage? At no her? one would. And it's like this. You, you, this often happens in, in, in sort of fiction where these people, these authors, are given more status than you would get in real life. Yeah. You know, it's. I'm sure there's lots of these sort of Jackie Collins type writers. But not but, as good, yeah. But not as good. Yeah. You know, that, that you know, that's largely a sort of a romantic and female following. But she wouldn't be mobbed and everyone demanding to know and chewing up and all this for... It's just, it's just nonsense. To be fair, Columbo does later refer to these as dumb questions. Yeah. She decides at the point that the flowers are delivered that she's not going to hold back any longer. After six years, this bunch of flowers is the one that swings it. She names Wayne mm-hmm. as the man she's been with and says that she intends to marry him as soon as she can. Yeah. We fade from there to... Her agent's office, a Jess McCurdy, and the secretaries, I think, in the office. Mickey, I think this is Mickey. A, a few of them are all watching this this interview on the TV, and it obviously causes a bit of a, a ruckus when this announcement's made, because Jess is in her own office and she buzzes through to Mickey and demands that uh, Charlie Fisher has got onto the phone. She wants something done about this. So we see Fisher in his office and it's fairly obvious that he's a private eye. Yeah. And he's been looking into Jennings on McCurdy's behalf. He has nothing on him. Nothing at all, really. So I suspect he's now told, come up with something, whether it's true or not. Yeah. The next scene was confusing for me. It wasn't just confusing, it was weird. So it's late at night. Jennings is in bed with a woman. But not the woman we mentioned earlier. And whose house is this? Who knows? And how did the person know to phone him there? Yeah. So that's why I think it must be his house. But if it is his house, it was massive. Does he own it? Or is it maybe her holiday home that he's staying at? No, but... So later, she doesn't know he's there. Yeah, because later he says he's staying at a hotel to play in, in the, this tournament. Well, well, this is just a massive suite at the hotel. No. He's, I think it was an outside establishing shot first, I think. Could be wrong. But then how would they know to phone there if they yeah. thought he was at this tournament? Don't know. It doesn't add up. It's dreadful. Unless we're missing something. We might be. But to be honest, this episode doesn't warrant a re-watching or a lot of time devoted to it. And even then, if it's not obvious to us who've watched all these episodes, how's mm-hmm. a casual viewer meant to know what's going on? So Jennings is in bed with another woman as she gets a call, apparently, as he gets a call, apparently, from Teresa. Yeah. So let's have a listen to the scene play out. Hi, it's you. Yeah, I tried to call you earlier. I guess you were asleep. Uh, just a minute. Let me get this phone untangled. That's better. I was a little late getting down here tonight. I had a rock and had some tire trouble. Oh, and I missed your broadcast. Oh, I wasn't on here anyway because of the tennis matches. <laughs> I got hung up with some guys at the club. I didn't hear what you said about marrying me till about 2 a.m. from a bartender of all people. And everybody started buying champagne. Honey, I love you. I love you so much. Shut up, you bastard. What? I'll never marry you. I'm not a fool. Teresa, what's wrong, sweetheart? Have you been drinking? Have you been talking to that meddling sister of yours again? No. I don't believe you. Listen, you get some sleep. I'm coming home tomorrow night. We'll talk about it. No, don't. I'm flying to Seattle tomorrow. I despise you. You're a joke. I hate you. I hate you. 
do you make of that? There's one very obvious issue with that call. Massive flaw, do you mean? The guy we've established has been in this relationship for six years mm-hmm. and he doesn't know it's not his partner on the phone. It's nonsense. Not only that, but we know that he is aware of the sister, so he must have met well, and spoken with the sister. We before. need to explain to the listeners. Or do we need to explain just now while we get to that? Yeah. Let's wait and we'll get to that. Okay. It certainly, it's clearly not Teresa that's speaking and he doesn't realise. And it's no secret because the way it's been been filmed... You know, you don't see her. You see an outline and you can see her hair style. It's different. Different, yeah. And why would you not see? If it wasn't not the person it's meant to be, you wouldn't film it in that way. Not well done, is it? Bad. Bad. Just a bad, bad thing. I blame the director as well as the writer. Yeah. Jennings, after this phone call, quietly leaves the house. Okay, she's in bed with this other woman. She's going to leave her there. But we don't know who she is. But she's not relevant. To is that story. Mrs. Rocco? I don't think so. Well, maybe it is. But I don't think so. Yeah, I think it is. Later, she's her other scene. Columbo phones her up and is putting pressure on her. I think yeah. it might be. But we don't know that. We don't see. There could have been a very quick scene with them drinking wine or whatever before him embracing this woman to show who it is. It was confusing. I thought it was a different woman, but maybe it was the same. So, yeah, he leaves the house. He Quick put, exit. Yep. He puts on a pair of murderer gloves as he drives through the night. Erratically and mm-hmm. quickly. Interesting, he noted on that phone call that he'd hit a rock and changed his tyres. Mm-hmm. That becomes part of his alibi later on. Yeah, so he calls Helen. Now, Helen was the, the tax consultant at 6.45am, leaving a message on her answer phone that he is in town but has changed his mind and is going to Teresa's place. See, this, the whole, even the alibi on watching it didn't really... No, I mean, there's no reason for him to update Helen as to his movement. She does his taxes. Exactly. A 6.45 call in the morning is more suspicious than anything. Yeah, to a phone that he knows logs the time. Yeah. Nah, not... Obviously, Columbo doesn't fall for that either, but... Uh. But it's not just that. It's... This isn't an alibi. He can obviously make this drive. doesn't prove anything that yeah. you were there at 6.45. There's no old school Columbo murderer um, shenanigans here with technology or changing something to make it look as if he just went somewhere and made a phone call. And it's like, yeah, but you could drive from there to there and make that phone call, couldn't you? Yeah. Well, it's not an alibi, son. That's basically it. Uh. <laughs> it's just dreadful. And it leaves this message. And. Um, we then see, uh, this was confusing as well, we see a point of view shot of someone watching as Jennings fires two shots into the body of Teresa lying by her fireplace. We never learned who that person was that was watching him. No, I can only assume it was a piece of bad directing. That it was only the camera, it wasn't meant to be someone else. You can't do that. That would confuse everybody. Yeah. I mean, when you do that, that's a, that's a POV. That implies, that represents a, person. a, a third party. Yep. You don't, you kind of see the body on the floor, you don't hear anything said. Mm-hmm. You didn't hear any conversation, you didn't see her getting shot. No. So you've not seen the killing, so immediately you're thinking, shenanigans. Yeah. Also, not Columbo. Jennings then flees the scene, clutching a, was that a brown paper bag? It's something in his hand. I think he had the black book, but I don't know what else he had. Mm-hmm. Maybe a gun. So yeah, I didn't understand the crime, the alibi, or the, the the motive. There wasn't a motive. No. Why would he kill her? What did he get out of that? Well, we find out later something, but it's it's the insurance policy, isn't it? But that's not established at any point. No. This deviates far too far from the, the, the Colombo formula and structure here. Yeah, this guy is not a principled, motive-driven killer. Jennings then arrives at a diner and he places a call at 7.15 to Mavis, who is Teresa's secretary. And he arranges to meet her at Teresa's house in one hour, but not to tell Teresa that they are coming. Okay. He then... Because he's pretending that he doesn't know she's dead. So this is part of his, to make it look as if I don't know. I don't tell her anything. It's just It's garbage. He then flirts with the waitress. See, this is the other thing that's annoying in this episode. It's like, uh, it's, it's almost like a, a male version of What's the Chops in Sex um, Sex and the Married Detective, where 
they're just incredible power. Everyone who sees him, every female who sees him just wants Melts. him. Yeah, yeah. Now, don't get me wrong, he's a good looking guy. But, he's in LA. Probably not the only good looking guy. No, I'm sure there's lots of beautiful people in LA. Yeah, you got Columbo's in this episode. Yeah, exactly. To be fair, if he walked about Glasgow, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't necessarily have that power either. Certainly I not think in folk LA. Are, are quite sceptical in Glasgow though. Yeah. If you tried all that, <laughs> find himself in a bit of bother. I just don't buy into any of this. So we go to Teresa's house now, and it's the the driveway. It's now the crime scene. There is some very frivolous intro music as Columbo eats a boiled egg and drives to the scene. Oh yeah, the trope of Columbo's bad driving. Mm-hmm. Did you note this old man? Didn't catch it this time. Mm-hmm. Very subtle. He arrives and cracks another boiled egg at the scene and is greeted by a Lieutenant Schultz who tells him that it is an open and shut case, doesn't know why Columbo's there, but Columbo informs him that uh, Teresa was a friend of the captain, I think. Yes, personal friend of Mrs Gordon was the captain. Do you remember the first time Columbo arrived with a boiled egg? Ooh. Come on. I remember he had one in Stitch and Crime. Yes. Is that the it? first one? Mm-hmm. I believe so. Okay. Where he taps on the murder weapon. Yeah. I remember going looking for salt in one of the episodes, which might have been after that. Yeah. Um, but look, you're thinking back to Stitch and Crime. A great episode, a classic episode, where a boiled egg, it's an okay little uh, augmentation to the, the episode. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously a hat tip back to what's been done mm. before here, but it doesn't make sense because he hasn't had a boiled egg in any of the other no. episodes. And he keeps going on with this, he keeps going on about this egg and the eggshells, and that's just an irritant as well. A little bit. But I think possibly because you're already irritated by the episode. I think so. That's it. Anything that these characters are doing now just gets on your wick. Yeah, you're primed to mm-hmm. rage about it. I don't understand Schultz either. What's he doing here? If the captain's assigned Columbo to the job. Yeah, who knows? That's two lieutenants. Perhaps this is his patch, but Columbo's like the. He's a top man. Well, yeah, Schultz gives the impression of being inferior to Columbo in terms yeah. of rank. Same rank, but perhaps not as experienced. Or not as senior, yeah, yeah. yeah. Schultz was played by Floyd Levine. He has been in The Hangover, Melrose Place, Sledgehammer, Cagney and Lacey, Hill Street Blues, Quincy, Kojak, Death Wish, and Mrs. Columbo. So we find out that the body was found by an open safe, and the murder happened around dawn, apparently. Yeah, and Columbo's distressed to learn that they've moved the body already. He watches as it is being taken out into the ambulance and he gets a, a picture from an instamatic camera from the crime scene photographer. Yes, see the original position of the body. Yeah. And she's wearing a very strange get-up, isn't she? It's in her underwear with a cardigan on? No, it's a dressing gown. Dressing gown. Okay. But with socks and shoes. Yeah. So she was starting to get ready to go out but pulled her dressing gown on for some reason. Inside the house, Columbo is shown the old safe and is told that about $100,000 worth of jewellery is missing. Teresa was found by the secretary around 8am and we also discover that a pistol is not where it should be. Dramatic. Columbo notices the broken French door window and he's puzzled here. Can you remember why? Yes, because the way that the safe had been opened would take an expert who wouldn't need to break the window to get through that door. We've actually we missed something I wanted to know. On you go. Well, the thing I want to know is when he gets the photograph, mm-hmm. the photographer does Columbo's old I have it here somewhere trope, yes. looking in his pockets for the, the photograph. I quite enjoyed that. Schultz describes the robbery theory to Columbo as Columbo himself, as we heard at the top of the show, rifles through her underwear drawer. Bit weird. Very weird. It doesn't seem to be relevant to the case either. No, not at all. He is one step away from putting them on his head. I wonder if in his um, spare time he's an underpant gnome. Underpant thief? Yeah, that's what the underpant gnomes do. Is it? That's quite an innocent term for what I would consider to be a low-level sex offender. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, there's not... I mean, I, I just don't get what he's doing. He's something about, oh, my wife wears the same, but that's not really relevant to anything. Yeah. 
Because at this point he hasn't inspected the, the photograph and is looking for the label. He hasn't found the clue, no. He just went straight. It's about a Colombo... Jiggy C- pokery CD- magic. CD. Magic, yes. He's went straight for her pant drawer. Her knicker drawer. This has been there before. I think there's also a trope as well, isn't there? That, uh, of course, Mrs. Colombo loves Teresa Gorn read all her books. Yes, and we'll be very upset if he doesn't solve the crime. Yeah. Going back to Colombo's problem with the broken window. Yeah. Schultz has a perfectly reasonable explanation. In a hurry? No, he says that perhaps he wasn't a professional thief and that he simply forced Gordon to open the safe. But they've already had the evidence that the fingerprints in the safe are smudged and that the last person to open it probably wore gloves. That doesn't mean that you're a professional thief. If I was going to break into someone... Yeah, but if you're you're saying Gordon did it, she wouldn't have been wearing gloves. Ah. Yes, unless he closed it afterwards. So he said to her, open that up, and pushed her aside and killed her. And is then in there and then sort of swings it shut as he leaves. Maybe. But there's enough questions in yeah, that sure. to, to look into it further, I think. Mm-hmm. Mavis. Yes, she's very teary. This is the secretary. Very sad. Yep. And she confirms that Teresa would wear socks with trousers. Slacks. This, this is the worst piece of evidence in any Columbo episode that I can remember. Yeah. Essentially, Columbo is learning because... She wore these socks, mm-hmm. which he thought were man's socks, um, with certain other clothes, with trousers. That means that whoever killed her must have known that she wore them with trousers. Truly awful. The clue yeah. is everything in this episode. It, it doesn't follow. You don't see the process. No. And for the first time in the episode, he's asking for... And this, I, I grant you, this might be the type of thing that you mentioned that I'm just looking to be annoyed. But... He keeps asking for an ashtray for his eggshells. I'd ask for the, the bin in the trash can. Yeah. That's not the first thing you think of. I need to get rid of these eggshells. I want an ashtray. Why? Ask where the trash can is. I suspect maybe he wants to get rid of the eggshells so he can light a cigar and he'll just need the ashtray so he might as well do both at once. You're giving him far too much credit here, I think. <laughs> Wayne shows up at this point. Yes, and Mavis runs out to embrace and console him. Yeah. He's arrived with his tennis bags. Another thing that annoyed me. He drops his uh, tennis rackets. But none of them are covered. They're all just in the bag without any head cover on. Yeah. You wouldn't carry them like a tennis pro or someone who owns, carries about with about 10 rackets would know how to look after a tennis racket. And yeah, have I mean, covered. the professionals, they have them in poly bags from the restringers. Yes, but even a semi-professional would have a, a zipped up head cover thing or on. Or something. Yeah, not just all loose. Mm. And Colombo is surprised to discover that Wayne was meant to be marrying uh, Teresa. Yeah, uh, Mary says all about, oh, did you not see it on the television last Cause, night? Yeah. Because obviously Columbo would have been watching that programme. Mm-hmm. Columbo assumed that he was just the tennis coach. Yeah. Where do we go next? Back to the agents. McCurdy. Jess McCurdy, her office. Mickey shows up. Yeah. McCurdy is exasperated at fielding all these different calls from the press about what's been happening. And she then takes a call from the captain... The police captain. Yeah. She doesn't seem that upset about um, the death, though. She never at any point gets beyond mild irritation that her client, who we later learn is her sister, has been murdered. Did you at any point in the episode suspect that she was involved in the, the murder? Yes. Yeah. So that's a very brief scene. Yeah, she leaves and tells Mickey to take calls and um, I act as though she hasn't been in yet. I think she heads off to Teresa's home. Yeah, Columbus, they are st- still, or again, with... Jennings? Yep. And he is surprised that a burglar did not steal one of the ornaments near the window. Yeah, well, Columbo's looking for an ashtray still that you talked about. Yep. So having expressed this surprise about the the expensive object, Mm -hmm. when he asks Wayne for an ashtray, he says, there's one right there on the table, but it's missing. Now, I wasn't clear. Were the ashtray and the missing green Buddha the same thing? Was it a $25,000 ashtray that they used as an ashtray? Yeah, don't know. Sloppy writing It again. didn't make any sense if yeah. that was true. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and also I don't accept this Columbo's problem that the, the burglar... Oh, he would have picked up a one ornament on the way by and, and pocketed it. He's used that before. That's been in a few episodes. I think Old Fashioned Murder yeah. had that, and there was something else prior to that yeah. as well. Maybe the suitable for framing. Yeah. If you're going for a hundred grand worth of jewellery in a safe, I'm suspecting that you know what's there. And you might not know anything about ornaments. You might think these are... And again, well, you're you can't... stealing to order. Exactly, stealing to order. Or, you know, these ornaments are far too hard to get rid of. I mean, who wants this little... 
you wouldn't know what you're doing. You go for a safe. Yeah. A burglar goes for a safe. I mean, and hopes there's cash. Even if there's, even if you're not stealing to order, you're assuming that that's where the valuables are kept. Yeah, yeah. Unless they had one of those waving cat things, because everyone wants them. <laughs> they then head up to Jennings. Has got a sort of a boys' room, a games' room, a sports room. I'm not clear that we actually learned anything valuable in this scene. I think what it's referenced later on. Okay, there's two things that we learn here. One is that he is three things we learn. One, he's an outdoor type of guy. He's a thrill seeker. Thrill seeker. So later on, uh, when he faints and that type of thing, it's unusual. Columbo thinks it's unusual for that type of character. Yeah. Columbo also has a little sly dig at uh, a person who takes part in all these activities. How does he find time to make a living? Mm. And also, he's questioned about the gun that he owns in yeah. this, this room as well. Yeah. We go back down to the driveway. Jess McCurdy pulls up. And at this point, what do we discover? Well, Wayne makes it clear that she was Teresa's sister. Yes. She is taking no nonsense and asks why Jennings isn't in Palm Springs. And he tells her that he found out about her TV appearance and came back home to be with her. Yeah. And there's a brief exchange where she tries to ask the detectives, I think, whether the black book was found. Mm Mm-hmm. But it doesn't seem to come to anything. And she doesn't seem that upset after a minute. This, she is the only character that I enjoyed watching. I thought was a nice and a, 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 a believable character. I thought her role was excellent up until the last ten minutes, in which at which point I was utterly disappointed. I didn't like her at all. No, I thought she was fine. I thought she was a no nonsense, not taking any crap, but also not showing any emotion at her sister's death. That. Her sister's violent, very recent, immediately past day. True, but as you have mentioned many occasions, this might be her way of dealing with it. She just died, so she's going to go on and start shouting yeah, and bossing people about. I'm not, you know, she might go home and break down and cry, but her persona at the moment is, nope, I'm tough, I can handle myself, I deal with all these people, I'm... Sure. Uh, and I, and I, I, see, I liked her interaction with Columbo. I thought the, the scenes were good, but... She collapsed at the end and we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We then have some very horrible alibiing as he, without any sort of provocation, explains that he called Mavis at 7.15, stopped at the diner and then bought a trunk full of flowers. Jeez. Oh. And he opens up this trunk to show proof of something. But not an alibi. <laughs> no. Having heard this, Jess is a bit confused because she assumed Wayne would have known that Teresa was going to Seattle mm-hmm. for a, a book signing, I think, that day. So there was no point in him rushing back. Yeah, but he claimed that he didn't know until he spoke with Mavis in the morning. Yeah. And that he had assumed that they would just fly up to or across or wherever Seattle is together. Up, oh, yeah, yeah. He then tearfully produces his grandmother's wedding ring. Oh my. Right, okay, is this something different in America? Because I would have thought that a wedding ring and an engagement ring would be two very different things. Yeah. Well, they are. I mean, over here, an engagement ring is an ostentatious jewel-encrusted diamond ring, and a wedding ring is likely to be a more simple band, either with some small diamonds or no stones at all. Mm -hmm. Is that different? Maybe our listeners can fill us in. I don't think it is different, but yeah, we can find out. McCurdy is having none of this sentimental nonsense and she just storms off. After she leaves, Columbo compliments Jennings on his sports car and in particular he notes the imported tyres that he has on it. And he tells Columbo that he had a blowout the day before on his way down to Palm Springs and bought two new ones. Yeah, he tells Columbo because Columbo only wants one. Yeah. <laughs> and he makes it clear to him you should be buying a pair. Oh, of course. Columbo then asks how long it would take to get from Palm Springs to where they are, Gorn's house, in his flash sports car. A Jag, I think it is. I'm guessing they're in Malibu, given the title, but it's never actually established. (laughs) True. Jennings says it depends on traffic, which is a fair answer. And then we see Columbo inspect the dashboard. That's quite important. Yes. We've had that clue before. It's all Mm. mind over mayhem. uh, It's shooting black. As well. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that one too. We go back inside the house and McCurdy asks Schultz if they have found a little black book in the safe. He says no. She suggests that Columbo get busy and Columbo agrees 
he then asks for Jennings' help to show him around the neighbourhood. Who do I think? We then have a little montage of Columbo and Jennings, like Batman and Robin, speaking with different neighbours, and it's a padded number of scenes here, isn't it? Yeah, the only clue, I think, from this part is that the cable TV wasn't working in the morning. Yes, and that there were, because of this, there were a couple of cable guys in the neighbourhood. Jennings looks a little bit concerned as Columbo leaves. Yeah. So Columbo headed down to speak to the cable guys, but all they can tell him was, was that they, they saw no one apart from a bird watcher. Someone with field glasses, binoculars. Peeping Tom. Most probably. I think Columbo gets a hold of their work schedule, but there's not much else not going on here. So we head back to, or he headed back to McCurdy's office. And he's watching multiple reruns of the TV interview. Yeah. When McCurdy herself arrives. And Columbo remarks on her sister's beauty. And McCurdy comes across as a little jealous of her, I think. Probably. Of the attention anyway. Yeah. They then discuss the relationship with Jennings and how he won't necessarily get any of her money. It's her and him that I'm curious about because I've been noticing this Mr. Jennings. He sure knows how to get along with women. Oh, please. All except you, that is. Well, would you want your sister to marry someone that much younger, without a real job, without a future, with no money? This one, he has nothing. You know, I was wondering about that money. I mean, she must have had quite a bit of it. But now he's not going to get any. Unless there's maybe some insurance. Insurance? Well, I just noticed that people who travel a lot, they always seem to have a lot of extra policies. As far as I know, I'm her sole beneficiary, Lieutenant. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. So there can't be any connection between her deciding to get married and her being dead. Could they? I don't think she's being frank. She's not. She's being Jess. How it is. She's withholding critical information from Columbo at this point. Which is? That... She knows that they weren't going to be getting married. Mm. But anyway, it comes out shortly. Jess McCordy was played by Brenda Vaccaro. Born in 1939, she has been in Midnight Cowboy, Johnny Bravo, Murder, She Wrote, Paper Dolls, Naked City. And I first noted her in Supergirl, the 84 movie. She was Oscar nominated in 1976 for Once Is Not Enough. Sounds like a James Bond film. It does. But it's not. Oh, well, obviously. In any case, McCurdy understands the implication that perhaps the, that perhaps robbery was not the motive for the murder, and she seems quite happy to be smirch Jennings' reputation before what happens. Phone rings. Who is it? Schultz, he's caught the bird watcher. So they both separately rush off. Yes, McCurdy hears this as well, and she knows who the bird watcher is, or yeah. suspects who it is. Yeah. So they all go to. Uh, Teresa's house. Yep. The PI's been caught and won't answer questions, so Columbo's going to set up a grand scene like he had in Commodore, where he gets all the interested parties into a room. He does, and then what does he do? He starts going through what he knows, essentially. The garage are backing up Jennings' story about the tyres. Mm-hmm. The mileage doesn't add up, so that's an issue. We just talked about this already. Yeah, he offers an explanation which is perfectly reasonable. He wasn't registered for the Celebrity Tennis Tournament. Because he's not a celebrity. I wonder if it was a pro-am, though. I wonder if you could sign up to play with celebrities. Yeah, but it's the pro-am, not a celebrity, and a, uh, that's the point. It's, uh, a, a pro, it's a pro tennis player oh, and a celebrity. Maybe not a pro-am, but maybe just a doubles tournament where you could play with celebrities. Maybe. So you don't have to be a celebrity. Mm. But it's not clear. So they're going to call Rocca. Yes, Mrs. Rocca. Or they're going to call Mr. Rocca, but Mrs. Rocca answers the phone. Yes. And how does this call go? It's fairly banal for the most part. And it's not, we don't find out, we're not, this is what we're saying, was she the person in the bed at the time when he got the the call supposedly from... I don't know. Because she seems quite confused and apprehensive about confirming when and where Jennings was. I think the suggestion here is, if I remember rightly, Rocca, her husband, was producing a film. That Jennings wants a, a part in. Yes. Jennings wanted to be at the tournament to be close to Rocca so he could schmooze hmm. and increase his chances of getting the part. So the call is just to confirm that he was in the area 
and she's not got all the answers. No. McCurdy is exasperated and claims that she knows that Teresa called at 3am telling him that the wedding was off because she was with her sister at the time, apparently. Yeah, I think at this point they pass the phone to Schultz to talk to Rocker, if I'm right. Yeah. And the rest of them get involved with Jess, who's going bananas. Well, he refuses to admit this call had taken place. Yeah. McCurdy then tells the private eye Fisher to admit to who and what he is and what he was up to, and he's quite happy just to spill the beans. Yeah, and now Wayne goes bananas. Because what does the PI reveal? He reveals that he saw the car. No, that one of his... Somebody he pays a, oh. a newspaper boy or whoever. Yeah, saw the car. Yep, heading south from that area just after 7am. And Wayne needs to be held back, essentially. He does. And collapses into a confession. He says, yeah, I did do it. I um, I found her uh, gun, her notebook with all these lies about me in, uh, in it. And I lost my mind. And I can't remember, but I think I may have shot her. And then Schultz Mirandizes him. Yes. After checking with Columbo. But. but <laughs> <laughs> they're interrupted. By whom? Another cop, unidentified. And he has information. He has the autopsy result. Which shows? That Wayne shot a dead body mm. and a different gun fired the kill shot to the head. Okay, where do we start with this one? This is a rip-off of one of my favourite Murder, She Wrote episodes. Murder Takes the Bus. Who directed that? Ha! Funny you should ask. That was directed by a Walter Grumman. He died in March 2015, age 93. He also directed this episode of Columbo. He has, in addition to that episode of Murder, She Wrote, directed another 52 episodes. And he has also directed The Bare Essence, The Streets of San Francisco, The Fugitive and The Untouchables. That's the TV series, not the movies. Okay. But yeah, that um, that episode, Murder Takes a Bus, was um, had the same plot. Of a chap killing someone twice in order to use the second one as an alibi for the first mm-hmm. or a cover. Yeah. We can chat a little bit more about what we think uh, in terms of crimes that have been committed later. Okay. After this has taken place, McCordy tries to make a sharp exit and she goes out to the driveway. Yeah, but she's not allowed to leave. Columbo catches up with her with a question. But before Columbo can ask his question, she discusses what she mentioned inside about being with Teresa when she made the call and why she had never mentioned it until this point. Yeah. And this is unbelievable. No, she says she wanted to talk to Wayne first, but... Give him a chance, basically. To do what? She hates the guy. Her sister has been murdered. Yes. You don't wait and she's more interested in stories. Yeah. Crazy. They then see Jennings being taken downtown by uniformed cops... But not to arrest him. Apparently, according to Columbo, there is no law against shooting a dead body. Mm, really? I suspect he's wrong. I can almost guarantee it. I would like to think, I thought about this before because of the Murder Show episode, uh, could, is this attempted murder? If you intentionally shoot someone with a, an intent to kill, I mean, what is attempted murder? If I shoot at you and try and kill you and I miss, you don't say, ah, oh, well... You didn't manage it. You missed. I would. I could get done for attempted murder. Now, I'm not going that far, but I think that at the very least you're interfering with... A, if you find a dead body like in an obvious crime scene and don't report it and then try and lie about it, you're, you're... You know, you're... All sorts of laws are breaking there. You also had the plan to kill in the first place. That's conspiracy to murder. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think I don't think he walks away from this. But... Do we give Columbo the benefit of the doubt and say Columbo knows this but he's setting Wayne up because he still doesn't believe he's innocent? Uh, if you've been very generous, yes, but I wouldn't give him that, that benefit. It's not the first time in this episode you would have to be very generous to let them away with what seems like a weird point. But that wasn't Columbo's question anyway. The, the question wasn't about the, the, the call. Yeah. Columbo wants to know when she left her sister's house that, that evening. And she responds by saying that she went there about midnight, having sent her Fisher's black book containing the, the information about Jennings, and she found her drinking and crying. 
and she left about 3am. Columba looks unconvinced by this. After the call, she says. Yes, after they made the call. There's a bit of a weird moment now with Schultz. What happens? Yeah, she leaves and he examines the, the death scene picture again and then hands Schultz a, a boiled egg. What well, He says something along the lines of when a snowball starts moving, push it or something. Yeah. I think Columbo had made that point earlier. Right. And this was Schultz repeating it back to him because Columbo had pushed the snowball and we'd got all this explosive revelation. Yeah. We go to the coroners. To the morgue. Mm. And this is, they try and inject a little bit of comedy with this guy, don't they? It's always funny, it's a bit of death. The doctor apologises for keeping Columbo waiting. He is in the middle of a shotgun job. Yes, the fellow's shot himself in the head. Yep. Box out, covered in, splattered in blood. The doctor confirms that the shot to Teresa's head was at 5.30. It was no earlier than 5.30. Yep. And at least 30 minutes before the second shot. Yeah. And he is surprised that neither the medical examiner or Columbo noticed the internal bleeding and the other injuries. Good point. Very good point. Although Columbo didn't see the body. Mm, true. Until it was already removed and on its way out. Columbo then wants to know if there was any evidence of sexual assault, but the coroner says no and invites Columbo to talk in his room as he finishes his job. Yeah. Columbo takes one moment to consider it and is not interested. No. Well, he walks in and immediately walks yeah, back yeah, out yeah. after he, I think he glances at the, the shotgun job face. And then he leaves. Probably <laughs> a lack of a face, I yeah. would imagine. In McCordy's office... She is in. She's emotional. She's teary. Yeah, she's sitting watching the interview herself now. Apologising to her sister on the TV as the secretary enters and tries to persuade and tries to persuade her to call it a night. So this is annoying as well. So she's perfectly nice to her and reasonable, and I suggest that she goes home. And Jess isn't interested. Then she mm-hmm. says something again reasonable, and Jess takes the hop, hump and leaves. Yeah, I mean, she says at least it wasn't Jennings who killed her. That's a relief, she says, I think. Yeah, but in fairness to McCurdy, I understand why that's not a relief. Yeah, it's, it's not a relief, but it's just the fact that she was so annoyed by that suggestion that she have got up and left. Yeah, but think about it. What does that mean? They don't know who killed her. Yeah. So that means that she's under suspicion? No, it means there's at least two people who wanted her sister dead. Yeah, is that? So that's not too good, is it? Yeah, that's true, it's true, it's true. The next scene's quite weird. Describe it. It's very hard to describe. Columbo's in a hospital. It reminded me very much of the hospital scene in Prescription Murder when they first arrive after the victim's not quite died. Mm -hmm. And you hear doctors being paged over the intercom. Columbo is shown to where Wayne is, who's not ill. No, he's flirting and eating a meal with a nurse. It's like they've got a fake illness. To keep him away from something. Yeah, why is he in a hospital? Was he, I think was he not actually wearing hospital gown? Yeah, it was. He says it's been arranged by his publicist to keep him out of sight for a couple of days. A, pu- a hospital. And not only that, the nurse has got a file. Yeah, and rather than tending to sick patients, she's been wined and dined by this character. Yeah, and then he tells her to get lost, and she reluctantly leaves. I think she's a bit upset. Very. Well, she's also not eating yet. The food's still on the <laughs> table. <laughs> Jennings goes on a rant about how. Teresa knew about his little indiscretions and can't believe that she turned him out, she dumped him after reading the lies in this notebook that she found. So basically what's he saying here? Oh, she knew I was horrible. Yeah. Yeah, I'd pushed her as far as I, as I could. This wouldn't, this wouldn't put her over the edge. He then reiterates what was meant to have happened and that he burned and he... He tore up uh, the. He burned the torn up love letters that he had found that he'd written to her. That were all over the floor. Yes. Yeah. But Columbo has another question regarding the notebook. Right, if I can just ask you one thing about Charlie's notebook, and I, I don't want you to go into it, sir. It's too upsetting. I know what's in it. Charlie told me already. But you didn't say what you did with Charlie's notebook. Lieutenant, I, I already asked Helen to call your office about that. Helen. <laughs> She does my taxes. She's the woman I phoned and left a message for on my way up from Palm Springs. Anyway, what I what I did with that damn notebook, I I threw it in a dumpster on my way into breakfast. Just just as dumb as everything else I did afterward. 
calling Mavis from that restaurant, buying all those flowers. Yes, so why don't you get some sleep now? And uh, I just want to say that I'll have a car come around 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Why? I, I thought your captain said I was free to go. Oh, of course. But I guess you realize that now you're the one person I can count on most to help find the real killer. And we will. Don't you worry. Again, if you're being generous, you might imply that Columbo is on to him mm. and he's keeping him close. But there's no indication of that given in anything other than those words, which you have to interpret that way yourself to get that connection, if it's even real. Mm-hmm. Wayne Jennings, played by Andrew Stevens. Born in 1955, he is the CEO of Andrew Stevens Entertainment and has produced over 175 movies. He has been in a lot of adult TV movie style uh, production, so softcore. If, yeah, not even softcore, like soft, 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 gentle core. Right, coreless, cord and peel. So he's been in Scorned Two, Silk Stockings, Point of Seduction, Night Eyes Two, Night Eyes Three, thirty three episodes of Dallas, mind you, Murder She Wrote, Ten to Midnight, a good Charles Bronson movie, and a truly uh, atrocious cult movie uh, called The Boondock Saints. If you think it's atrocious, then it must be bad. It is. It's not really worth watching, but the documentary on the making of it, uh, it was a guy called Troy Duffy from uh, Boston Irish, and there was a documentary about how he put this together, and that's it's called Overnight, and that's definitely worth a watch. Why would you have watched that in the first place if you hated the movie? I knew all about the movie. Oh, okay. Uh, but I knew that, yeah, the, the story about this this guy, it's, a, it's an interesting story, but the guy's a complete throbber. It's a bit like uh, William Shatner. Columbo, Columbo alumnus mm-hmm. recently put a documentary called Chaos on the Bridge about how they put together the start of the Next Generation Star right. Trek show and the first couple of seasons of that were pretty bad and it explains what was going on behind the scenes it's really very much worth a watch on Netflix in some I, countries I'll look out for that also Andrew Stevens he auditioned unsuccessfully for the role of Luke Skywalker back in the 70s that would have been very Hayden Christensen if he'd got that mm. don't know who that is he played Darth Vader in the new movies. Really? Not seen him. Could not act his way out of a paper bag. So we head off to Helen's office. Now Helen's the tax the, the, the tax lady, the tax lover. She's not Rocco in any way. No. And she plays back Jennings' answer machine message and attempts to defend him, claiming that Teresa often put pressure on him. She also admits to having this relationship with Jennings, but admits to understanding the nature of it. Yeah, bit of background here. She then gives Columbo a copy of the tape and demonstrates that the call was indeed placed at 6.25am. Yep. We then have a discussion that makes little or no sense. Helen confirms that Jennings had made uh, Teresa the sole beneficiary for his life policies and that she'd obviously had to reciprocate the gesture with a, a $1 million policy. This This is garbage. Right, correct me if I'm wrong. As I understand, you can't double insure a risk. So if you've got more than one life policy, they are all going to end up suing each other, Mm. the companies. You can't get payment from all the different policies. Sure. Well, that's the same with um, car insurance. You can't have multiple car insurance for the same car. Yeah. Because if you crash it, you can't claim five lots of cars for for one. Yeah. So if this this is her only life policy, that's Mm. fine, but... The impression given was that she has another accountant of her own and would probably have life policy yeah. information there. Leaving aside the technicalities of life insurance or life policies, uh, she said that when he first started dating her, this was meant to be a romantic gesture. Who does this? Look, this is how much I love you. I'm going to give you everything in my. I'm going to give you my life policy. What is this? What sort of idiots do this? I don't know. And she felt obliged to reciprocate. One good turn. Ah, this is dreadful. I'm getting more angry as I think about this episode now. Not only, the, yes. Not only that, it's introduced at this late stage after he's been eliminated as a suspect. Mm-hmm. And it's not followed up on. 
No. And Helen goes a step further. She says, however, you know, he's not getting this $1 million anyway because he's going to give it all to um, Teresa's charities or something. Sure he is. Yeah, of course he is. We're back to Teresa's house. Jennings arrives to find Columbo inspecting the safe and claims to have found the second bullet that Jennings himself could not remember if he fired or not. Yeah, it's kind of a magic bullet that's kind of curved off two walls and landed right in a bit of wood mm-hmm. without making any noise. Columbo suggests that the twenty two caliber gun used to shoot this bullet by the real killer may have came from Jennings' uh, sports room. He angrily denies that. He does. He denies that he owns one he does. of that calibre. So they go outside and they all get into a, a cherry picker that the cable guys have provided. And we find out nothing, really. Just that the cable guys saw no one come or go by car between 5.50 and 6.25 in the morning. I have to say, as a highlight of the episode, if you played this scene in the cherry picker at double speed, that would probably top everything else. Yeah. We learn that there's another nearby house of interest. A beach house. So Columbo goes down to the beach front and walks along to it. That reminded me of Murder or Self Portrait. Mm. I thought you were going to say Weekend at Bernie's. That as well. Mm-hmm. I suppose he's propped up the corpse of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> he's walking around with it. So whose house is it? Jess McCurdy's. He arrives and he just sort of stands at the back porch, the back yeah. veranda. And he speaks to McCurdy. He queries why Teresa was half-dressed so early in the morning when apparently McCurdy herself had only just left her at 3am. But she says that's normal. She would always have got up early. Mm. She states that she had arranged for the Seattle book signing to get Teresa away, as far away from from Jennings as possible. Not that far, really. It's only a little bit up the road. And they then discuss how innocent and soft-mannered and soft-natured Teresa was, apart from the phone call that she made. Columbus then got a little admission to make. Yeah, it's similar to last week. You remember it was by the pool when he's forced to confess that he's actually got some evidence and he can prove that what's being said is not true. So what does he? What is he able to prove? It's the ubiquitous phone records, mm. <laughs> which are the source of so much consternation in Columbo podcast lore. Yeah, and what does it prove or disprove? The call wasn't made from Teresa's house yeah. at all. Faced with this information, McCurdy breaks down. What the hell are you really doing here? To ask your permission to check with the telephone company about your long distance calls. That is. Why what? From here? Well, I'm sure it's just a mistake. You know how those computers are, but so far, at least, there doesn't seem to be any record of that phone call to Palm Springs. Not from your sister's house, at least. So I got to wondering, uh, because I noticed, Miss McCurdy, you're a little like myself. Uh, When my wife, when she gets all steamed up, uh, I don't say much until I know that it's safe to say it. And like I said, I noticed in Mr. Jenny's confession that all those awful words that he said your sister used they just didn't sound like her so what i got the wondering was well i had this other brother in high school he was older than me and he used to get all these calls from all these girls and i discovered when i answered the phone that if i grooved a little and grumbled sounded like him then wow the offers he used to get and the things these girls used to say to him Boy, it was like an education, but it was easy to fool him. All right, all right, you made your damn point. Is this episode the first time we hear about Colombo having brothers? Hmm. Do we believe they exist? No. Well, Italian family, Italian Catholic family, probably did have brothers and sisters. Maybe. I tend to think that they do exist, but not in the way he's describing them. Yeah. Another strange thing. He says that those don't sound like words that Teresa would use. How does he know? Hmm. Well, I think it's because he's saying that uh, they've established that she's quite sort of timid and good-natured. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's earlier or later than this. He mentions that even in the interview on the television with the stupid questions, yeah. she was sweet to people. Mm-hmm. But again, people change when they're angry. Yeah. So, Especially when there are personal relationships involved. Yeah. So McCarthy explains the reason that she made the call, and it was because... Teresa was too weak 
to end things with Jennings. In her opinion? Yes. Her housekeeper Rosa then appears, saying that there is a call for Columbo. And as Rosa leaves the room, she she's grabbed by Jennings. It appears that they've got a thing as well. Yep. Like I say, this guy can't go anywhere. Every single female that he comes into contact with wants him. It's bizarre. And, and they have him. Yeah, yeah. I don't like it. No. And we talked before about the sexualisation of the Columbo show. Mm-hmm. It's not necessary. The call that Columbo receives is from Schultz. What have they found? A gun. Columbo leaves. Just in time for Wayne to enter. McCurdy tells him to leave. But instead, we have a ridiculous piece of garbage. We then go to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Describe this nonsense before we go to the beach. Uh, he talks and says that she's always wanted him, so she punches him in the face. Yeah, but well, before that, what's happened is that uh, apparently they're both guilty. Oh, they both feel the same. Yeah, so he assumes that she didn't kill her sister, which, is, which she denies. Mm-hmm. So he says, We both feel the same guilt. We allowed this to happen and didn't do it ourselves. But it's not the same guilt. Yeah, you tried to do it. That's the difference. You tried to kill your, her sister. No, no, but he's, he's won her over because after she punches him in the face, she then embraces him in a passionate. Well, no, he embraces her. She it, reciprocates quite ev- clearly. Eventually, yes, but it's a, it's like the, the, the it's a James Bond rape kiss. He basically uh, kisses her until she likes it. It's like no, 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 no. Okay, this is quite good. That's what happens. It's a disgusting turnabout from a powerful lady who despises and hates this person who she knows for a fact at this point tried. Shot the the body, the dead body of her sister. Yeah. And now, a couple of kisses later, and she's acting like a teenage school kid. It's weird. It's disgusting. It, At all levels, it's disgusting. It undermines the entire character we've been told that she is. And it's yet another person that he's interested in has fallen at his feet. Mm-hmm. After one kiss. Yeah. Oh. Jealous. Wish had that power. <laughs> if you could have any superpower, <laughs> it would be the power of Wayne Jennings. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he's like um, you know the Purple Man, David Tennant plays in Jessica Jones, where whatever he says, people do or they want to do. Yep, no idea what any of that means. So we'll head to the beach. <laughs> they have found a gun buried in the the sand near the footpath that leads to Teresa's house. They have. That's about it. That's the entire scene. Yep. Then go to the morgue. The coroner again turns up with an, an organ in a jar. Apparently it's a... They're diseased, poisoned organs. Point, yeah. uh, Columbo takes some clothes and that's all that's in that scene. Then goes to LAPD. Well, no, but, yeah, but he, so, uh, again he inspects her underwear. He takes her clothes but he inspects it. No, well, that's at the start of the next scene. He's moved. Is it? I thought it was the same. Well, see, I think, well, Schultz shows up so I assume he'd gone to LAPD with it but he could still be at the morgue, I guess. Maybe the morgue's in LAPD. I don't know. Anyway, wherever he is, he's looking at this underwear and Schultz shows up and looks at him quizzically. Yeah, suspiciously, I think. It's the second time he's found him sniffing about. Literally. Mm -hmm. So he tells Schultz he's to visit Jess one more time. He's just been there. What happens? I think he leaves and Schultz sniffs underwear. (laughs) I could have got that wrong. (laughs) What happens after that? Uh, Rosa (laughs) says... It's a series of short, short, silly scenes that didn't need to be... Yeah, yeah. He goes to Jess's home and she's out. And that's the whole scene. <laughs> yeah. Well, Rosa, he notes uh, Jennings' car is parked there, and Rosa informs uh, Columbo that they've both left together to go shopping. In a different car. Yep. To get their Rolls Royce. That's it. So, Columbo follows them to the a clothes shop. Yeah, we get there before Columbo does. And, as I said, there's a massive about turn here because uh, rather than being a strong, powerful uh, woman, She's completely submissive. He's styling her. Yeah, and she's going, oh, I don't look good in this. Oh, does this make my bum look big? All that sort of stuff. And uh, he's got complete control over her now, and she's utterly unemancipated. What's the, what's the opposite of emancipated? I, mean, uh, I don't know. That one, anyway. He she all he has superpowers. Is this wish fulfillment from the writer? Is this what he wishes he could do? Yeah. It appears to be so, because, yeah, it's just mental. It's... It, there was very clearly no female involvement in the scripting of this episode. Probably not in the direction or the production of this episode. It's such a masculine world view that yeah. doesn't make any sense. Yeah, not I'm, only that, but I'm, I, when you say masculine, I'm thinking more. Uh, image, I'm thinking more fourteen-year-old schoolboy stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Imagine if imagine if every girl wanted you. Yeah. And then yeah. you killed one of them. 
But then Columbo got you. I'm going to make an episode. Columbo does show up mm-hmm. at this point and explains what happened, despite the fact we've had no lead up to this whatsoever. He tells her firstly that um, Teresa was shot not by an intruder, but in cold blood, possibly whilst she slept. Although there was no evidence of any sort of blood or bullet or anything in so, the bedroom. Yeah, so what we're saying, we know. Yeah, there's, no, there's never been a discussion of moving the body either. Nope. So, it, so essentially he shot her in the head, creating a wound that didn't bleed, mm-hmm. moved her through the house, no, dressed her, moved her through the house without making a mess of any kind that you couldn't clean up. any anywhere yet. Placing her in that sort of weird crouched position over the safe and then shooting her again by the time we got that done. It's just a dire, dire episode. Not only that, Columbo has also deduced that this was not his original plan. Yeah. Let's wrap this up. So, Columbo asks McCurdy if uh, Teresa wore slacks when she travelled on a plane and she confirms this to be the case. Yeah. Oh, th- oh this is painful. To this, Columbo claims, OK, I know who did it. Jennings. Yep. And he goes on to explain what Jennings did. Well, yes, he had this original plan to shoot her wherever she was then scoot back to Palm Springs and act like he'd never left. He denies it, but Columbo claims to be able to prove it with the help of the photograph that shows a label. McCarty takes a look at this. Uh, it's a close-up. It's been yeah. magnified. She doesn't see what it is at first. But then she notices something and she immediately, um, apparently dawns on her and she tries to attack Jerry. She launches at him and yeah. calls him all the things that she called him in the phone call and tries to beat him down. And, and we, then he gets taken away. Yep, and we are none wiser as to what's been going on here. Yep. So fortunately, Schultz is still about. Yep. Dr. Watson. He asks Columbo... What was that all about then? Columbo explains. Columbo, I don't understand. What the hell is wrong with this damn picture? Well, here, let me show you on these panties. Hold this up. Here. Oh, well, this is Vanity Fair, but the label is on the left side. That's where they usually are. American-made panties always used to be on the left. My wife told me that. But Mrs. Gorin's panties were made in form. I saw them in the drawer. That's what my wife wears. And made in form panties are always on the left. The panties I just saw in the morgue, left side. But in the photograph there of the body, that label was on the right side. So how did the label get from over here all the way around over there? Well, there's only one answer. The panties were put on backwards. And you don't think she would do a thing like that herself, do you? Garbage. You know that the shop they were in, they say it's um, California's largest lingerie department. Do they? Don't get it. Somebody will. Okay. Pants run backwards, so guilty as charged. <laughs> it's dreadful. Let's move on to the season review. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. We need to. We need to. We need to have a rant about this. I need to have a rant about this. That's it. Her pants were on the wrong way. Therefore, someone must have dressed her, uh, and that someone must have been Jennings. No. I sometimes. What the, the other day. I end up at work the whole day. I couldn't go to the toilet because I put my pants on the wrong way and I couldn't, there wasn't a fly there. We all noticed. Yeah, I don't know how you know it to be standing behind me. Uh, but, uh, sorry, apparently she was up drinking and crying the night before till 3 a.m. Apparently. So, you know, in the dark at 3 a.m., you're hungover, you're, you're still drunk, in fact. There's she two might- ways to this. Either it was possible for her to do it wrong or it was so impossible that even he must have noticed. Yeah. When putting them on because I don't know, you know, you get lots of different types of women's underwear, hung many of them out in an era, mm-hmm. but it's very clear where the back is and where the front is. Yeah, it's, even if it was, even, even if that somehow proved that she didn't dress herself, it doesn't prove he did it. No. There's only one man that can uh, sum up my thoughts just now. Oh, I think I know who you mean. Will you give me proof, Lieutenant? Where is your proof, Lieutenant? Yeah, you could have saved that for the yeah, I think season that review. Probably reveals our, our thoughts. <laughs> so, all in all, I mean, some of the performances, some of the acting wasn't too bad. I liked McCurdy. Mm. Uh, I thought, I mean, Andrew Stevens um, was was okay at playing that horrible creature. I suppose he was believable as what well, it was very soapy. It was badly written. It was badly directed. There wasn't. He didn't put in a bad performance. Yeah. He had nothing to work with. The story was garbage. 
It was horrible. Yeah, I, I think she just cancelled the show now. All I'll say is this: it doesn't it doesn't go entirely downhill from here? There are better episodes. Oh, that's a relief. This isn't rock bottom. Oh, come on. In my view. Oh dear. Well, it's a longer show today, so I guess when they're they're this bad, we've got more to talk about. Don't worry, this will be getting edited down. I'll find our episode <laughs> if I can. Let's quickly do the episode review. You oh, do we need it. to? Yes. Okay. Motive. There wasn't one. It was unclear completely. I yeah, don't f- get it. Financial. He was after he was trying to marry her for her money. After he thought he was being dumped, he decided to kill her and try and get this insurance policy. It wasn't rational. No. Clues. Oh, we never mentioned that as well. Sorry, that was another thing. That was diabolical. Apparently, you know, um, the freeway can sound like crows. Mon uncle? <laughs> oh, I'll get to that. <laughs> I'll get to mon uncle. Um, yeah, that was, I forgot, forgot to mention that. That when he claimed that, uh, sorry, you can't hear me for this busy freeway, Columbo said, yeah, and that, that actually sounded just like crows moving. Crows uh, on flight and no, flight. Not just Columbo, the experts who analysed the tape said that. That isn't. I'm sorry. If you're an expert, you can't tell the difference between birds and a car engine. You need to be in a different job. You're fired. I think I remember it might have been on. I can't remember what show it was on. Carl Pilkington mm-hmm. was asked what superpower he would want. Right. And it was the ability to, ability to detect garbage. <laughs> yeah. folk use it. Not in that word, but um, yeah. he would have that power and he could just sniff it out and point at someone and say, and this would be one of those occasions. Definitely. So the clues. The crows in the call, the car mileage, not really, uh, the panty label, the life insurance policy, that's about it. And they weren't really the convincing. Confession of the second shooting, I guess. Sort of, yeah. Uh. I don't even want to think about it anymore. Nope. Let's move on. Gotcha. The label. No, not having it. No. No. Nope. Nope. I mentioned there, Mon Uncle. Now, we've had a bit of fun with that since uh, the first episode of this season. We're about to talk about that. We are. Well, it's still nonsense within the confines of the show and in Colombo. We may have overlooked a, a nod that the writers gave to another uh, a higher art form. Okay. So... Jacques Tati was a, a French filmmaker. I think he only made about six, seven, eight movies. Done a lot of, sort of surreal stuff, but was inspired by Silent Era. Uh, done some uh, physical comedy as well. And one of his famous movies was called Mon Uncle, which was about a bumbling, genial detective who wore a Mac, a, a raincoat, a beige raincoat. Well, that makes sense, mm-hmm. but it still doesn't excuse oh, no, the doesn't, way they used it in the episode. It doesn't excuse it. I mean, it's just a nod to something else, but it's nonsense in the episode. But I think it was, I think that, I'm, I'm assuming that it must have been, it must have been that that they were nodding to. Interestingly, if anyone's interested in getting into this, mm-hmm. you can actually buy Mon Uncle on both Blu-ray and DVD. I'm tempted. <laughs> I'm tempted. We could run a competition, have it as a prize. I think it's, um, it's a little bit like Mr. Bean, that, that movie. Not all his works like that, but that one is very physical comedy. They don't, it doesn't say much. He gets into physical situations where he is in trouble, just like, like Bean would be. But he is very highly regarded. I know that, uh, David Lynch, as you'll be well aware of from, uh, Twin Peaks and Mulholland Drive. Okay. Etc. A lot of really surreal, weird, odd movies. He, uh, that's one of, uh, Jack Tati, one of his, Inspirations. Inspirations and heroes. So, yeah, anyone interested in that should check out Jack Tati. Production notes. Well, we've discussed the director and the writer already. The original air date with, was the 14th of May 1990 and it was uh, 90 minutes in length and it felt about two hours. It took me more than three hours to get through this. Yeah, it's hard to do in one sitting. In the middle of trying to move house, I was getting a lot of dirty looks. <laughs> Yeah, most of the trivia I've covered here. Yeah. And apparently, I can't remember, in the one of the first pilots, I think it might have been Ransom for a Dead Man, mm-hmm. Colombo mentions that his next case is uh, a murder in Malibu. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Will we do the season review? I think we need to. Explain the concept. I keep meaning to explain the concept of the podcast, which you need to remember to do next week. Next week's episode 10, uh, season 10 starts, we can yeah. do it. Yeah. 
Anyway, the concept for our season review is that we take the cases from that season, we throw out confessions on the basis that a good lawyer would have them excluded from evidence, and we say, with the benefit of such a good lawyer, would the person in question be convicted of murder? Murder a self-portrait? Nope. Why not? You didn't do it. Okay, let's... A little bit more uh, The evidence is based on dreams and uh, an ancient murder that can't be proved. Yeah, I agree. Not guilty. Cries wolf. Guilty or not guilty. I'm going to go to not guilty. I'm going to go guilty on this one. So they found the body in his... Chateau. Chateau. But as we know, it's always full of people. He could have claimed to be with anyone. He's presumably going to have his girlfriend give him an alibi. Uh, you may, well, you're presuming that. I could also presume that she fold. Maybe. She didn't look like the folding type during the episode. Yeah, but once she's... A bit bendy, but not folding. <laughs> no, I think if there's pressure applied, then she is um, threatened with being an accessory or a accomplice. We're getting to speculation, though, aren't mm-hmm. we? We are. So what we do know is that the body was found in, in the uh, house. In the house. There's no evidence of who killed her when or with what. Okay. I'll go with go with you on that one then. Not, uh, not guilty. Agenda. I'm going not guilty. I think you can show he was at the scene of the crime, but mm-hmm. I don't think you can completely remove the doubt that a good lawyer, probably himself, mm-hmm. would have been able to come up with. The suicide story is not disproved by anything that they've been yep. showing. All the the cheese and the, 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 the teeth marks, as you say, all that uh, proves is that he was there. Now, what I would do if I was him, the, the victim did ask for a meeting to discuss him helping him out, perhaps illegally. Yeah. You can concede to that meeting. So you'd say, yes, I was going to help him out. The reason I didn't say it was because I was about to use my influence illegally to get him off this charge. Uh, or so not. I, or was, not. Yeah. But I was there to discuss that and I didn't want to get involved because of the the political situation I'm involved in. Indeed. So I was there, but didn't kill him. I agree. Not guilty. Not guilty. Rest in peace, Mrs. Colombo. I think she's in a bit of trouble. We know that she provided Columbo with a poison jar of marmalade, so she attempted to murder the Columbos. Yes, so she's certainly down for attempted murder. But this is a tricky one because we say exclude the confession, but giving this confession was part of her plan. Yeah. So I think we can't exclude this one. I think I know we're bending the rules. I agree. But I think you have to include this confession, and I think that there might be an issue with its admissibility in court, but I think there's enough circumstantial, plus the evidence of Columbo, would see her convicted. Yes, I agree. Uneasy lies the crown. Ooh. I'm going not guilty. Because we remember, as you yourself, you were uh, at pains to point out, if he simply says, no, prove it. Yeah, there's no proof. There's no proof. So if he now changes his mind and they have to go and do this experiment. It's not a real experiment. It won't work. So it's not guilty. Yeah, agreed. Mm Mm-hmm. Columbo's struggling this year. He is, and this week's episode... Not guilty. There's not... Yeah, there's not, there's like, not proof of anything. Nothing. They can't even prove he exists. Nope. Let alone... Pants on backwards there. don't count. Yeah. Liar, liar. If I was him, pants. I would go into court with my pants on backwards over my trousers. I'd go on with my pants on my head like Blackadder. Our, our American and friends to, are going to be getting concerned with our use of the word pants. Yeah. Underpants. Underpants. Yeah. Or as Columbo... Panties. I hate the way they call it panties. It's such a... It's not, I, CD. I don't hear that word very often in conversation. No, it's mainly used in a more sensual yeah. discussion. I don't think on a day-to-day basis that's what they're referring no. to us, is it? No. My wife wouldn't say, oh, uh, can you p- pass me one of those uh, panties? <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been thinking... <laughs> put them down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she would say, please put those panties down. Uh, I, I, How I, many I, times do I need to tell, tell you? Yes. Um... <laughs> <clears throat> That's enough. That probably get cut. <laughs> so there we have it. Uh, an unimpressive uh, result season for Colombo. In our view, I mean, we might concede Cries Wolf on a push, but that's still four two against him. Mm-hmm. But overall, if we ignore this episode, yep, I mm- thought three strong episodes at least, and one decent. So, mm-hmm. yep, I think if we use uh, salty from the forums. Um, way of scoring is basically par above par or below par we've got three above par a par and one that's uh, out of bounds triple bogey yeah <laughs> so not too bad no we should point out to listeners that in terms of seasons mm-hmm. the 
DVD box set calls everything that comes from now on season 10. We're not going to do that. We're going to go with the IMDb season splits and work from there. Yes, keep it simple. Okay, that's us. Glad to see the back of this episode. Hated it. What's the next one? Next one is Columbo Goes to College. Oh dear. I can only imagine the inappropriateness that's going to follow. You might be surprised. Anyway, we... Oh, I've heard that title. That's got a, a returning face. Mm-hmm. Ah. Anyway, we'll come to that next time. In the meantime, please, whether you use iTunes to listen to the podcast or not, go there, rate, review, subscribe. It makes a big difference. More folk hear the show. We can boost the popularity of the, the podcast, which hopefully will get folk talking about Colombo, which is great for everybody. And... Get in touch with us, columbopodcast.com. There's a post up for every episode as we go through it. Twitter, Facebook, the usual. And we'll see you next time. Cheerio. Bye-bye. You have been listening to the Columbo Podcast from Herd Yet Media.